Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the presentation. This presentation will discuss modeling energy recovery systems in lab buildings and compare modeled performance results of four systems to actual post-occupancy performance. The learning objectives, how to model an energy recovery system to obtain accurate results, common pitfalls of modeling an energy recovery system in a lab building, how to obtain accurate post-occupancy results, how to make post-occupancy results user-friendly, and then we'll look at some comparisons between design phase model calculations and actual post-occupancy results. Important factors to achieve accurate modeling results. Energy recovery system performance is not constant for every hour of the year. Most commercial models calculate the system performance using a constant efficiency value for the energy recovery system for all 8760 hours of the year. But in actuality, the system efficiency changes as outside air temperature and humidity change and as building operating conditions change such as air volumes, supply air temperatures, exhaust air temperatures, et cetera. So energy recovery system performance needs to be calculated and input for every hour of the year. To achieve accurate model results, calculate for every hour of the year, the energy required to heat or cool the space, the energy recovered, and the power consumed by the energy recovery system, both pump power and the added fan power to overcome the air pressure drop through the energy recovery coils. Input data for operating conditions rather than design or emergency conditions. When modeling a system, the data input has to reflect the operating conditions for every hour of the year, not just the winter or summer or emergency design points. If the model input data is only for the winter design point, which only occurs, say, 10 hours a year, the model results will be far away from actual post-occupancy results. And the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number of the fluid in the tubes of the energy recovery coils needs to be greater than 3,000 to maintain turbulent flow. If it falls below 3,000, the flow becomes partially laminar or even completely laminar which destroys the heat transfer coefficient. Then the recovery performance of the system drops dramatically, even to the point where no energy is being recovered. So it's very important to ensure that the Reynolds number is calculated for every hour of the year and that it's always above 3000. Critical inputs, supply and exhaust air volumes with turndown conditions, winter and summer supply air temperature, accurate supply and exhaust air temperatures, accurate building humidity data, the altitude of the building location, the air pressure drop through the coils, the climate data for the city the lab is located in, coil phase velocity, type of heat transfer fluid being used, exhaust coil freeze protection parameters. Let me take a minute to explain this one. To protect the exhaust coils from freezing, some of the warm heat transfer fluid going to the supply coils needs to be bypassed to the exhaust coils to ensure that the fluid going into the exhaust coils is warm enough to prevent freezing. The fluid being bypassed to the exhaust coils never gets to the supply coils, so it's not available for energy recovery. This amount of fluid needs to be calculated and accounted for in the model. If it isn't, the performance of the energy recovery system will be falsely elevated. The model should calculate 8760 hourly heating and cooling requirement, 8760 hourly energy recovered, 8760 hourly energy consumption of the energy recovery system, 8760 fluid flow rates, 8760 heating and cooling power requirement without energy recovery, 8760 heating and cooling power requirement with energy recovery, 
8760 system temperatures, both air and fluid, the peak heating requirement, the reduction in the peak heating requirement, the peak cooling requirement, the reduction in the peak cooling requirement, and exhaust coil frost bypass GPMs. Okay, let's look at some model output. First, let's look at the results of the energy calculation values. There's a blow up of these values on the right side of the screen. We'll look at the rest of the information on this sheet in the next few slides. This table shows the annual heating, cooling, and energy consumption results with and without energy recovery. The annual heating requirement without energy recovery is 1,906 million BTUs. With energy recovery, it drops to 204 million BTUs. The annual cooling requirement without energy recovery is 2,486 million BTUs. With energy recovery, it's 2,421 million BTUs. The last two lines show pump and fan energy, and the table also shows the number of heating hours and cooling hours per year. Another portion of the output from the sheet on the previous slide. This graph shows the 8760 operating hours, the climate data for the city the building is located in, and if the energy recovery system is running. The x-axis is outside air temperature. The left y-axis is absolute humidity in grains per pound, and the right y-axis is percent relative humidity. This graph is for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The green circles that are filled in show when the energy recovery system is running, and the green circles that are not filled in show when the energy recovery system is not running. The circles that look a little distorted in shape is because there's an overlap of operating points at those temperatures and humidities. Some more model output. The graph on the left shows the heating and cooling power requirement at different outside air temperatures. The x-axis is BTU per hour. The y-axis is outside air temperature. The blue bar is without energy recovery and the red bar is with energy recovery. The graph on the right shows the annual energy requirement at different outside air temperatures. The x-axis is a million BTUs. The y-axis is outside air temperature. Again, the blue bar is without energy recovery and the red bar is with energy recovery. So looking at these graphs, you can easily see the reduction in power and peak demand and the reduction in the annual energy requirement with the energy recovery system. And one last slide of output. This shows the reduction in peak heating requirement. You can see that it's reduced by 65%. Knowing this, you can properly size boilers, taking into account the 65% reduction in peak heating demand. Calculating post-occupancy performance. Continuous monitoring. You need to monitor the system continuously so you have all the data you need to calculate post-occupancy performance. Record data with every change in value, not just hourly or once daily. Archive data. You need, you need archive data in case something looks funky in performance calculations. You can use the data to figure it out. Automated calculations. Your IT team needs to be on board from the beginning to automate calculations. Hand calculations or sorting spreadsheets will be a nightmare. Continuous reporting of data. To be user friendly for the building owner, you need a dashboard to display energy requirement, energy recovered, savings in dollars, and CO2 reduction. And this data needs to be updated continuously. Some examples of dashboard screens, trends, heating requirement, and heating recovered by month, and annual energy data summaries. Okay, let's look at some model results versus actual post occupancy results. This is an academic research lab in Colorado, 100,000 CFM of outside air. On the left is the model performance. 
the model calculated 92% annual heating effectiveness, which means 92% of the annual heating requirement comes from recovered energy. The actual post occupancy results 2017, 94.9%, 2018, 93.1%, and 2019, 90.5%. So pretty close to the model. Another system, an academic research lab in Massachusetts with 210,000 CFM of outside air. The model calculated 87% annual heating effectiveness and actual post-occupancy results are 2014, 87.5%, 2015, 84.4%, 2016, 88.8%, 2017, 87.5%, 2018, 86.9%, and 2019, 84.8%. So again, pretty close to the model. And another system, a research lab in Colorado with 160,000 CFM of outside air. The model calculated 62% annual heating effectiveness and actual post-occupancy results are 2016, 63.2%, 2017, 68.2%, 2018, 66.7%, and 2019, 68.7%. So again, pretty close. And one last example, a medical treatment building in New Jersey with 100,000 CFM of outside air. The model calculated 98.5% annual heating effectiveness and actual post-occupancy results are 2017, 96.6%, 2018, 97.5%, 2019, 85.9%, and 2020, 98.1%. You can see that in 2019, the performance went down by about 10%. The archived monitoring data shows that in 2019, the supply air temp was increased from 55 to 65, and then set back to 55 in 2020. So this explains the decrease in performance. And the model was run at supply air temperature of 55 degrees. Lessons learned. Compare apples to apples. The details of the energy recovery system are often not included in the model which results in a significant difference between model performance and actual performance. Commercial models require a lot of custom input to accurately simulate the operation of the energy recovery system, and it's worth the time and effort to do this. Exhaust coil frost bypass considerations are often forgotten in models, which results in an overestimating annual recovery. The building owner needs to realize that models use historical climate data, which will always be different from actual winter and summer conditions. Post-occupancy operating conditions always differ from design conditions. After occupancy, the building owner may change the supply air temperature, turn down hours, turn down air volumes, etc. from design conditions. Portions of the building may be unoccupied, some equipment that enhances the energy recovery system may not be running. For example, indirect evaporative cooling in the exhaust air. If this is designed into the system and shown in the model, and it's not running for maybe the first year or so, it has a tremendous effect on the cooling recovery. And use current utility costs. From the time a building is designed and modeled until it's actually occupied, there can be significant changes in utility costs. Install all instrumentation needed to calculate post-occupancy results. You can't measure what you can't read, so make sure all sensors you need to calculate performance are installed. Building humidity sensors are often forgotten and they're needed to calculate cooling recovery. And lastly, you can't have too many air and fluid temperature sensors. They're relatively inexpensive, 
So install as many as you need. Questions?